Hello greetings and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. If you are new, please hit the subscribe button, become one of my YouTube students. In this video, we'll be looking at chemical bonding exam questions. I'll be looking at the question that you see behind me. We'll be answering questions based on chemical bonding, Lewis dot diagrams and so on. Let's go. In this question, it says in the reaction below, they give me a chemical reaction over here. 3 grams of sodium carbonate, Na2CO3, is reacted with hydrochloric acid, that's HCl, and an effervescence is observed. That's the bubbling that you see in the picture over there. First things first, even before you read this first question, you should see this equation, and immediately your mind must go to, is it balanced? It has to be balanced in order for us to do stoichiometry, which actually does come later in this question, but I'm not doing it in this video. It's always good to make sure that your equations are balanced. And that's the first question here. Copy and balance the chemical equation. So this is good. We're doing some balancing practice as well. And let's balance the equation. So when balancing an equation, we need to make sure that the number of atoms of each element on the left hand side is equal to that on the right hand side. That's basically what balancing is. It may help you to do the following. List the elements, so sodium, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and chlorine, listed on both sides, and see how many elements you have on each side. So for example, on the left-hand side, I have two sodiums. On the right-hand side, I have one. On the left-hand side, I have one carbon. On the right-hand side, I have one. I have three oxygens on the left-hand side, and two plus one, three oxygens on the right-hand side, one hydrogen here, two hydrogens here, one chlorine, and one chlorine. This helps some people, especially if you're a beginner at balancing. Other people don't need it. Then what you do is you make sure that the number of elements for each element on each side is equal. So the first thing that stands out to me is the fact that there's two sodiums on this side and only one sodium on this side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the sodiums by two, and you can only balance by putting big numbers in the equation. So big coefficients, you can never add little numbers, ever, ever, ever. So the only way I can balance it is if I put a big number over here. Okay, so what I've done is I've made sure that the sodiums are now the same, but that also affected the number of chlorines. So now I no longer have one chlorine on the right-hand side, I have two. Because I messed with the chlorines on the right-hand side, I have to balance it on the left-hand side. So this also needs to become two. Here's the chlorine. It means I need to put a two over there, which means I've also not only messed with the chlorine, I've messed with the hydrogen. So I've made a two over there. But let's take a look. My sodiums match, two, two. My carbons match, my oxygens match, my hydrogens match, two, two. And my chlorines match. So I've balanced it. The next question says, write the name and formula of the substance that caused the effervescence. So remember I mentioned that the effervescence was the bubbling that was observed in the test tube. So what do you think caused the bubbling? They don't give phases here in this equation, but sodium chloride, that's basically like table salt, NaCl, H2O, you know that that is a liquid, a pure liquid, and CO2. What phase is CO2 in at room temperature? Gas. So CO2 is a gas. The CO2, the carbon dioxide, is what's call it, causing the bubbling, the effervescence. So basically, your answer is carbon dioxide. They want the name and formula. So carbon dioxide, which is CO2. Please read your questions carefully, because in some papers, they might just say, give me the formula of the substance. And then if you say carbon dioxide, if you write it out, you're going to get it wrong. If they say, give me the name, and you write CO2, you're going to get it wrong, because the name is carbon dioxide. So read carefully. 6.3 says, from the chemical equation, write down the formula. So again, not the name, the formula of two compounds that are... First one, covalent bonded or covalently bonded and then ionic bonded. So as a recap, how to tell if something has or contains covalent bonds or ionic bonds in grade 10, what we do is we look at the periodic table. You should know that there's a step on the periodic table that exists over here. It separates the metals from the non-metals. You should know that everything on the side of the periodic table except for hydrogen, hydrogen is an exception, Everything else is a metal, and everything else on the other side of the of the step, so all of that, those are non-metals. 
You should also know the following about bonding. Covalent bonding occurs when a non-metal bonds with a non-metal. Ionic bonding occurs when a metal bonds with a non-metal and metallic is within the metal itself. It's between the metal atoms. We don't really deal with metallic a lot, so we focus on covalent or ionic like the question's asking. Remember, a metal bonding with a non-metal, that's not the formal definition for ionic bonding. Remember, the definition is the transfer of electrons from a metal to a non-metal to form a formula unit. There's a formal definition sheet that you can access these definitions, but we can recognize if it's covalent or ionic by using this method. So, which compounds, formula of two compounds that are covalently bonded so what we need to do is we need to look at these things we need to look for one that contains a non-metal and a non-metal so immediately you should be able to tell me that co2 is covalently bonded because carbon is a non-metal oxygen is a non-metal take a look at where they sit on the periodic table here's carbon non-metal oxygen non-metal a second compound would be water Water contains a non-metal oxygen, okay, non-metal, and a non-metal hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen's over here, but it's a non-metal. So two compounds that could be included in covalently bonded or covalent bonded would be CO2. And remember, they want the formula. So CO2 and H2O would be your answer over there. Then ionic bonded. Remember, ionic bonds contains a bond between a metal and and a non-metal. So the easiest way to do this is to identify what element in this equation above is a metal. And I hope it's obvious that sodium is a metal. If you look at your periodic table, sodium is actually a group one metal. It's an alkali metal over here. So sodium's a metal, which means that these two, this sodium carbonate, NA2CO3 and NaCl, are ionic bonded compounds. 6.4 now wants me to draw Lewis dot diagrams. Some people call this Lewis diagrams or it's not necessarily Lewis dot, but let's do it. So CO2. So how we do a Lewis dot diagram is as follows. We know we have one carbon, two oxygens. So what you need to do is you need to go to your periodic table and you need to look for the elements in question on the periodic table. So we've got carbon over here and oxygen over here. Then you need to locate, or you need to tell me, how many valence electrons does each element have? Because we need the number of valence electrons to draw the dots around the element. Carbon is in this group over here. It contains that many valence electrons. Oxygen is over here. It contains this many electrons. You always use the Roman group numerals. So the Roman group numerals, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You use the Roman group numerals to tell me how many valence electrons there are. So carbon has four valence electrons and oxygen has six. So how you draw the um, Lewis dot diagrams are as follows. Remember carbon has four. So one, two, three, four. And we have two oxygens. Each oxygen has six valence electrons. One, two, three, four. So each side gets one, five, six. Okay. Same with this oxygen. One, two, three, four. Start at the top again. Five, six. Now, the, they do not want the formation of CO2. So these individual Lewis dot diagrams that I'm drawing are not necessary in your answer. But the reason I do them is because it helps you see how I get to the answer. Okay. So just follow me. Carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen each has six. I hope you remember from my video on Lewis dot diagrams, I have quite a few. So check them out, link down below. But I hope you remember that we need to follow the octet rule. Octet means eight. Each of these elements need eight electrons in their outer energy level to be full and stable. So if carbon has four, it needs four more needs four more oxygen each has six they both need two more now the things that they need they're going to end up sharing okay they need to share with each other in order to get those extra electrons that they need so this oxygen 
needs two more. It's going to share two with this carbon. My other oxygen also needs two more. It's going to share these two with this carbon. So because carbon is sharing with two other atoms, carbon needs to go in the middle. The stuff that it's sharing gets pulled to the middle. So we're going to put our oxygen on this side, our oxygen on that side. The stuff that is being shared is going to go to the middle. So these two electrons from this carbon are going to be shared with this oxygen. So those two need to go to the middle. Okay. These two electrons from the carbon are going to be shared with this oxygen. So those two need to go to the middle. Now, just as the carbon is sharing with the oxygen, the oxygen also needs to share with the carbon. So these two electrons will be shared with the carbon and these two will be shared with the carbon. Remember, the shared stuff goes to the middle like this. Now, the rest of the stuff that is not shared, let's highlight it in green. The stuff that's not shared, they need to be placed where they existed originally on the atoms. So like that, you need to keep them in pairs, please don't separate them. It doesn't matter that this space here is open. It doesn't matter. These little electrons need to stay paired. We can't take one away there and put it there. It needs to stay paired. Okay, so it's called a lone pair. These are bonding pairs and these are lone pairs. Okay, cool. So now take a look at what's happened. We have carbon in the middle. Let's count. Carbon has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And if you count the number of electrons for the oxygens, they also each have eight. So what has happened is carbon dioxide contains two double bonds. That's a bond. That's a bond. Double bond. Same thing here. This is the Cooper structure, which they didn't ask us to draw. So in order to get your full marks, all you need to do is draw the final answer for me. The reason I did the other stuff is to help you so that you can understand. Let's do 6.4.2. Okay, so I've started off H2O. H2O, this chemical formula tells me that I'm going to have two hydrogens. You can see that I've drawn those two hydrogens over there. Each hydrogen has one valence electron. Take a look at the periodic table. There's a one there. Oxygen, again, has six valence electrons. Now, what's interesting about hydrogen is it's one of the, it's the exception to the rule. Remember we said the octet rule says that everything needs eight in order to be stable. So oxygen has six. It needs two more because it wants eight in total. Needs two more. Six plus two gives me eight. But hydrogen has one. It needs one more. So hydrogen only needs two electrons to reach a full noble gas configuration or full outer energy um, configuration. So each hydrogen needs two in total. So it needs one more. What that means is this extra electron that the hydrogen needs, it's going to share with the oxygen. So this hydrogen is going to share this electron and this hydrogen is going to share this electron. That way, these little electrons will also be shared with the oxygen, meaning that the oxygen will have six of its own plus the two that it's sharing. So oxygen will have eight. So oxygen needs to go in the middle like this. The stuff that was originally there, we place where they originally were. Okay, so everything that was there originally stays where it was. This hydrogen fits in that place over there, shares its electron. This hydrogen fits in this place over here, shares its electron. If you count the number of electrons around oxygen, you'll see that it has eight. If you count the number of electrons around hydrogen, you'll see that it has, they each have two. I hope that this was a useful recap for you. Please let me know what else you'd like to see in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Bye everyone.